Hello folks, today we're going to have a look at the particles questions from the higher physics paper in 2017. So the first question is number seven. It says the following diagram gives information on the standard model of fundamental particles. And you can see uh, a diagram showing the zooming in on a piece of matter. So we zoom in one stage and we can see the atoms within that piece of matter. If we zoom in on one atom, then we can see the nucleus and the electrons orbiting that. We zoom in further and we can see inside the nucleus, the protons and the neutrons. And then if we zoom in on one of those protons and neutrons, then we can see the quarks that make them up. So part A says, explain why the proton and neutron are not fundamental particles. Well, the answer is kind of in the question there. The proton is not the last stage of that process. Protons and neutrons can be broken down into smaller particles, the quarks. The quarks are fundamental particles because they cannot be broken down further. Part B, an extract from a data book contains the following information about three types of sigma particles. Sigma particles are made up of three quarks. And we can see information about uh, the sigma plus, the neutral sigma, and the sigma minus. We can see their symbol, their quark content, their charge, and their mean lifetimes. So, a student makes the following statement. All baryons are hadrons, but not all hadrons are baryons. Explain why this statement is correct. Well, you'll be wondering why there's a cow on this slide. Well, a cow is a mammal, but all cows are mammals, but not all mammals are cows. And that kind of is the same situation with baryons and hadrons. Hadrons are a generic umbrella term for all particles which are made of quarks, in the same way that mammals are all animals which give birth to a live young or whatever, not a biologist. Baryons are a specific type of hadron, and they're made up of three quarks, in the same way that a cow is a specific type of mammal. But there are other types of mammals, in the same way that there are other types of hadron. So a hadron could also be a meson, for example, which is made up of quark anti quark pair. So, as I've said here, little like all cows are mammals, but not all mammals are cows. Part two, the charge of an up quark is two thirds of an electron. Determine the charge of a strange quark. Well, sigma plus particle has a charge of plus one electrons worth, as we saw in the table earlier. And it's made up of two up quarks and one strange quark. And we're told in the question that the charge on an up quark is two thirds. So that plus one electrons worth is made up of two, two thirds of an electrons worth plus one strange quark. Therefore, the charge of a strange quark must be one electrons worth minus two thirds minus another two thirds, which leaves us with minus a third of an electrons worth of charge. Part C. One, state the name of the force that holds the quarks together in the sigma particle. Well, there are four fundamental forces of nature. There is the strong force, the weak force, the gravitational force, and the electromagnetic force. And the one that holds quarks together inside the nucleus of an atom is the strong nuclear force. The name of the boson associated with this force is the gluon. D. Sigma minus particles have a mean lifetime of 1.5 times 10 to the power minus 10 seconds in their frame of reference. Sigma minus are produced in a particle accelerator and travel at a speed of 0.9 c relative to a stationary observer. Calculate the mean lifetime of the sigma minus particles as measured by this observer. So, this is a time dilation question. And we have this formula for time dilation, T 
dash equals t over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. t dash is the time measured in, a, in another frame of reference. t is the time measured in the frame of reference of the object that we're talking about. So we're trying to work out t dash, the time observed by a different frame of reference. t is the time observed by the sigma minus particle in this case. So we put our numbers into the formula and we get a time of 3.4 times 10 to the power of minus 10 seconds. Number eight, x-ray machines are used in hospitals. An x-ray machine contains a linear accelerator that is used to accelerate electrons towards a metal target. The linear accelerator consists of hollow metal tubes placed in a vacuum. Electrons are accelerated across the gaps between the tubes by an alternating supply. Calculate the work done on an electron as it's accelerated from P to Q. So work done is QV, charge times voltage. The charge is the charge of an electron, which we can get in our data sheet, 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. And the V is the potential difference that is accelerating the charge. And in this case, that was 25, uh, sorry, 2,500 volts or 2.5 times 10 to the power of 3 volts. And that gives us an energy of 4.00 times 10 to the power of minus 16 joules. When it talks about work done, remember work done is just the energy changed. So this is the energy that is changed from, in this case, changed from electrical energy in the circuit into kinetic energy in the electron. Part two, explain why an alternating supply is used in the linear accelerator. Well, we need to think what's happening here. So here's a little animation. And there is an electron being accelerated through this linear accelerator. Now, an electron has a negative charge. So a negative electron will be repelled away from any negative charge and attracted towards any positive charge. So as the electron goes through these rings, it's important that the electron is moving away from a negative charge and towards a positive charge. So as it goes through each ring, as it approaches a ring, we want the ring's charge to be positive, but as it leaves the ring, we want the ring's charge to be negative. So in that, for that reason, we want the rings to be able to change from positive to negative repeatedly as the electron is accelerated through. So the alternating supply ensures that the force on the particle is always in the same direction. If they weren't alternating, then the electron would just move back and forward between uh, two rings. Here, electron always needs to be repelled from a negative ring and attracted towards a positive ring. The electron beam is then passed into a slalom magnet beam guide. The function of the beam guide is to direct the electrons towards a metal target. Inside the beam guides, R and S, two different magnetic fields act on the electrons. Electrons strike the magnetic sorry, the metal target to produce high energy photons of radiation. So we can see the electron beam enter on the left hand side. It is bent upwards as it passes through the beam guide at R and then its path is then bent downwards as it passes through the beam guide at S. So determine the direction of the magnetic field inside beam guide R. So a magnetic field is causing this electron beam to be moved upwards. So we need to use our right hand rule here. Right hand because it's electrons that we're dealing with. All right, electric current, the right way to think about electric current is in electrons. Therefore, we're going to use our right hand. We would use our left hand if this has been talking about a proton. So Take our right hand. We extend our index finger straight out the front. We, we direct our second finger at right angles to it. So it's pointing at right angles to our palm. And our thumb is pointing straight up. 
Now, the first finger is the field, the magnetic field. That's the one we're trying to find out. Our second finger is our current. So the current, in this case, is going from left to right across the screen. So I'm going to turn my hand around so that my second finger is pointing from left to right across the screen. So basically I'm trying to point away from my index fingers pointing away from the screen. My thumb is the force that the electron is experiencing, which is upwards. So my thumb is pointing upwards. My second finger is pointing from left to right across the screen. So my first finger, the field, is pointing out of the screen. This is easiest to do if I go around the back of my computer and stand facing the other way. So second finger left to right across the screen, thumb up the screen, because that's the direction the electron's being forced, and the first finger field is pointing directly away from the screen. So if this had been on a piece of paper, it would be directed out of the page. Part two, state two differences between the magnetic field and side beam guides R and S. So as we look at R and S, we can see two things happen. One, the two are directing the beam in opposite directions. So S must have a magnetic field, which is in the opposite direction to R. Also, we can see that R only bends the beam slightly, whereas S bends the beam through a full 90 degree angle. So the magnetic field at S must also be stronger than R. C. Calculate the minimum speed of an electron that will be produce that will sorry that will produce a photon of energy 4.16 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. So what's happening is an electron is hitting that uh, that screen and causing a photon to be emitted. So the absolute least energy that an electron will have as it enters as it, as it hits the um, screen will be equal to the energy that the photon has that's emitted. So providing there's no loss in energy, then all of the energy of the electron is transferred into photon energy. So the electron has kinetic energy as it hits the screen. Therefore, we can use our kinetic energy formula. The energy that the electron had before it hit the screen is the same as the energy that the photon has once it leaves the screen. So the energy is 4.16 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. The mass is the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms, which you get from our data sheet. And so we just need to do a little bit of algebra to work out the value for speed. And it turns out to be 9.56 times 10 to the power of 6 meters per second. Question number nine. A diagram from How Things Work website contains information about a nuclear fusion reaction. So here's the reaction of helium-3 with deuterium. And we can see the deuterium and the helium-3 combining, and that creates a helium-4 nucleus and a proton, as well as some energy. So, State what is meant by nuclear fusion. Well, nuclear fusion is where two small nuclei join or fuse to form a larger nucleus, a little bit like this. The following statement represents this fusion reaction. So there's our helium nucleus and our deuterium, and that makes the uh, alpha particle, the 4,2 helium nucleus, plus one proton. And we are given a table telling us the masses of each of the particles involved. Explain why energy is released in this reaction. Well, if we add up the total mass before the reaction and the total mass after the reaction, we'll find some mass has been lost. This lost mass is turned into energy. Determine the energy released in this reaction. 
Okay, so if some energy is created by the loss in mass, we need to know how much mass is lost. So we need to know what we have before the reaction and what we have after the reaction. So this is the reaction. These are the masses that we have before and after the reaction as given in the table. So we add up the total mass before and the total mass after the reaction, and we find out that these are the values that we get. They're very similar, but not quite the same. So we can find out the difference in mass, the mass that's lost, by subtracting the two masses, and we get a value of 0 0.033 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms, a very, very small amount of mass. However, that mass is converted to pure energy. And to find out how much energy that corresponds to, we use the formula E equals mc squared, which is that loss in mass multiplied by the speed of light squared, which gives me 2.97 times 10 to the power of minus 12 joules. That's per reaction. In a nuclear reaction, there will be countless reactions happening repeatedly every second. So the total energy released is very, very high, even though each individual reaction only gives a very small amount of energy, as we can see here. And that brings us to the end of the particles questions for the 2017 higher physics paper. So I hope you found this useful. And I hope you come back and listen to some more another time.